Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about the first 90 days as a commercial banker and the playbook for success in commercial banking in general when it comes to selling and sourcing business. So this video is, is geared towards students that are just straight out of school going into their first commercial banking job or people that are transitioning into commercial banking and want to understand, well, how do I approach this job in terms of what I need to learn first to be successful over the long term? So to really do that, let's look at what makes a commercial banker successful. And there's really kind of three core buckets. The first and, and the most important is new business development. In commercial banking, you're expected to source loans on behalf of the bank and underwrite those loans and successfully place them on the book. And I would say the vast majority of your compensation, because typically commercial banking, like most finance jobs, has a base salary and then a variable bonus tied to how much business you bring in. So the vast majority of your compensation is also going to be tied towards originating those loans, developing new relationships with centers of influence, which are typically business professionals, accountants, lawyers, whatever the case is, and also attract a certain level of profitability because not all loans are the same. A million dollar real estate loan is vastly different from a million dollar cash flow or unsecured loan where the interest on that loan is higher. And really the way the bank makes money in commercial banking in general is that they take the money from their banking deposit system, customers deposit money with them, and they then take that money and deploy it at a higher rate than they're paying on the savings rate. So if they're paying a 1% on the savings rate, so long as, as you know, they're generating, you know, three or 4% on the money that they lend out, the spread is what they keep as the profit. Because at the end of the day, all banks are really just repurposing the money that the customers give them. So attracting new business is going to be the primary driver of success in commercial banking. The second one is referrals to other groups. And what that means is that typically you're going to work for a large lender. And so there's going to be multiple divisions within the bank. There's going to be a wealth management group, an investment banking group, a cash management or day-to-day -day banking, you know, branch level group group. And so what ends up happening is you're really as a commercial banker, typically lending term loans, operating lines, equipment loans. And so that's really finance, financing the long term and medium term success of that business. But that business owner may need, you know, some personal wealth management services or may need to sell that business. And the bank that you're working for is typically going to have divisions that do that. So if you can take a client that you've brought in on the lending side and repurpose that client to become a wealth management client or an investment banking client, that will also get you paid. And that's what a lot of successful commercial bankers do. Because what ends up happening, and I'll talk about this later, is that you'll take that deal and bring it to a wealth manager. And that wealth manager is now going to bring another deal to you to obviously repay you for the referral that you made to them. So it can really open up a lot of sales opportunities as well. And then typically, outside of new business and referrals to other banking groups within the, the company, it could be just managing the book in general, which means you know ensuring that there's no credit losses, that loans aren't written off, that you're meeting certain targets set by the by head office. It could be you know 25% of your new loans are towards uh, you know first generation entrepreneurs and immigrants or you know female founded businesses, and so those qual qualitative metrics also round out the scorecard, which is really the, the, the bonus plan for, for commercial bankers. So to be ultra, ultra successful and to make a ton of money in this business, the really the vast majority of the focus is going to be on new business development. So what does that mean? So how, what kind of core skills are required to be successful? Well, the first one is obviously a sales ability. Commercial bankers are providing solutions to help owners achieve their goals and grow. So matching the right loan structure to their needs is critical to winning that deal and also delivering something of value to the end owner. Now, this requires an ability to A, source deals, but also structure those loans and think on your feet while having a good understanding of general business concepts to present the right solution. So not only are you, do you need to be confident to get out there and source that business using your sales skills, but 
commercial bankers and six ultra successful ones, they're quick. You know, they're, they're, they're in that very first meeting, they can kind of already analyze what does this business owner need? What type of product can I structure to deliver a solution to them? Because I'll repeat this many, many times in commercial banking, money is the commodity. What is not the commodity is being a solutions driven banker. So if you can deliver a solution, then you're, you're always going to win clients. But if you're going to give the cheapest cost of money, then you're really competing with a ton of other bankers out there, and you're just you've commoditized commoditized yourself. Now, another skill that's really important is your credit skills. Naturally, you need to understand how to write loans, how to underwrite them, how to analyze them, make sure that they clear all debt servicing and that they're on side with all their co- covenants. Communication skills and confidence feeds into your sales ability. You need to be able to reach out to new prospects and centers of influence, you know, business brokers or accountants or lawyers that work with businesses that you're going to look to lend to. And then you need to know your edge. So one of the things in in commercial banking is because money is a commodity and, you know, that business owner is most likely going to have a lot of options that can go to multiple banks to get that type of loan, the basic type of loan. What you're looking to do is target an area in the market where your loan structure or programs available by the bank are more competitive than other competitors. You're trying to find the edge. And what that means is you have to know what that edge is. And I'm going to talk about that later. And then lastly, you need to have a strong internal network. So remember, 25% of your compensation is going to come from referrals to other groups. So you need to have a strong relationship with people within the bank in addition to, and most importantly, your risk adjudication team. So as a commercial banker, you source the deal, write up the credit application, and then submit it to the risk team who approves that deal. You don't approve your own deals, obviously. So having a good relationship with your risk team is going to help you A, win more deals because they're comfortable with you, they know who you are, and B, they're also going to give you strong insight into where you need to focus as a commercial banker. So these are some important things, and typically a lot of this stuff can be done in the first 90 days. So there's a roadmap. This is how you kind of achieve these things. So let's look at the 90-day game plan, the foundation to success. A lot of people try to get out and start cold calling and sourcing deals right away. You know, what I found and what, you know, my personal success story is that I didn't do that. You know, what I did before I went out and talked to people is A, I learned my product. I wanted to know how to loan, how to underwrite, where where do I fit in the marketplace based on the current bank that I'm working for, and how can I competitive, competitively compete with other banks because you know especially in the in this era in the in the 2020 era you know money's very cheap you know interest rates are really low it's ultra competitive out there so you need to really know your product cold and a lot of junior bankers don't do that they just go straight out into the market they try to talk to people hey are you looking to borrow money and that's not the point remember money's the commodity you're a solutions driven banker find the solution and to find the solution you need to know your product cold now, typically, you want to identify internal deal makers. Once you know your product, you then want to go and build a relationship with your risk or credit team. So that means partnering with them, communicating with them. Then you want to go internally. Typically, you know, when you first join a commercial bank, they're going to give you an existing book of loans to manage, the loan book. And so with that loan book, it's actually a good training ground to practice talking to business owners, you know, asking the tough questions, walking through sites and developing your knowledge. Because I remember, I, I you know, I came out of school and I didn't know anything, right? You know, how, how do you ask a business owner what they need in, in a professional and effective manner? So using your loan book as a training ground is really important. And with those meetings, you start to develop your confidence. And ultimately, once you know your product, you've worked with people internally, you've built a relationship with risk and you've practiced that within your book then you go out into the market and you effectively increase your chances of sourcing business good business and also closing on those leads versus just going out and trying to you know make mistakes and learn on you know in the open market where you're competing with a ton of other bankers you know so i find that this roadmap is a lot more successful so let's go into step one 
So step one, learning your product. As I said, money is a commodity. Commercial bankers sell business solutions. If you can position your mindset that way, it's going to be a lot easier to stand out in the market. So going out and trying to source deals too quickly can harm your reputation. Before you speak with clients, you need to learn about the lending programs available and how to structure and analyze deals. Typically, they'll give you training manuals, but those aren't enough, right? You know, they'll ask you to go through these, you know, click through PowerPoints and, you know, on the on the internal portal and they'll t- teach you what a term loan is, amortization and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, there's nothing like the real world experience. And to do that, You know, you need to move away from the training manuals, do them just to get them out of the way, but also do extra. And so how do you do that? Well, the best thing that I did is that I accessed the internal portal and typically you'll be in a regional office or in a a district and there will be an internal database of all the historical deals that that region or that team has done that are obviously available for you to pull in and access, right? And so if you can click into that portal and read those credit applications that have already been processed and completed, it's going to give you a ton, a ton of experience in a very short period of time because you're going to be reading about the types of structures that were done in those deals and the businesses themselves and the industries that they're in and the outlooks of those industries. And also, when typically in those credit apps, there's going to be responses by credit. So you're going to see where credit focuses in on. They're going to focus in on one section versus the other. They're going to write certain comments that that relationship manager is going to need to re- reply to. And so if you read all of these credit apps, and when I joined you know, at my commercial bank, I probably read two, 300 applications. And it, I just downloaded everyone's brain because I was able to learn from their experiences. And that was a tremendous way to accelerate my learning very quickly without making mistakes in the open market. And what I would do and what I would recommend is once you've re- read these applications, find the relationship manager that sourced the deal and then ask them about the deal. How did you win the deal? You know, where did you find the lead? You know, what were some of the challenges that you encountered with, you know, the client, with risk? How did you overcome those challenges? And, you know, you start talking with that relationship manager and everyone loves talking about their deals. Like you're going to have no trouble going up to that person and being like, oh, you know, like I'm new here and I read your deal, really cool company. Like, how'd you get it? You know, and you start getting, you know, pieces of advice. And and by the way, what that does is it feeds into step number two, because you're going to be talking to these relationship managers and not a lot of people do this. And, and, you know, that relationship manager is going to be like, wow, you know, this person's really interested in wanting to learn more. Yeah. You know, I did this and this, Hey, how about you come out on a meeting with me? And, and that's how you start to build those internal networks as well. But this is a great way to do this upfront because, you know, you're new, you can use that excuse to say, Hey, I just want you to kind of tell me about your deals in the past. And they're going to give you a ton of advice. And then obviously you want to go into the internal database and also download all the risk guides, all the programs, all the lending programs, read the criteria, rewrite them in a notebook and summarize them in very high level terms. The size of the loans, the types of amortization that you can do, the pricing, the level of leverage, the level of loan to value. These are kind of key criteria that you need to remember based on the pockets of, of, of deals that you can do. And typically it's going to be allocated based on you know cash flow loans, equipment loans, management buy loans, M&A loans, you know, and you can kind of play around and, and start to remember that criteria because that's going to be the, 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 play, the sandbox that you can play in. And then as you continue to read about these deals and talk to the relationship managers, in general, you should be reading the day-to-day news. You should be reading, you know, kind of just business-related content so that you can develop your understanding of how business owners think. And, and, I, and I feel like a lot of people, and, you know, right, rightfully so, you know, you come out of school, you don't really have a good understanding of day-to-day business. So the best way to do it is read these apps and continue to read in your spare time to develop an understanding of, you know, why do business owners sell and why do they think like this and why don't they buy new equipment all the time? Why do they go into the used market? And all these little decision-related things that are going to help you think on your feet when you're in front of a client later on. Now, learning to sell means learning to walk and talk like a banker. So again, you're coming out of school or you're coming from a completely different line of work, you're not going to really have a lot of exposure to that. So the best way to do that is to identify people on your team or people in other districts and start 
to ask them questions and eventually build the relationship or get that exposure to say, hey, you know what? I would love to come and join you on your next meeting, prospect meeting or client meeting and, and just be a fly on the wall. And, you know, get in there and start to support more senior relationship managers and bankers and take advantage of being the new employee and saying, listen, I just want to learn from people like you that are successful. And again, I don't, a lot of people are not going to turn that down. They're just going to be like, okay, yeah, just be quiet, please, and take notes. But, you know, obviously just watch me do my thing. And, you know, they're going to really allow you to kind of see how to talk and how to really react and engage with clients. So that's really important to do. And you should do that early on before you yourself go out and talk to a a client cold because you know you want to make sure that you speak in a manner and ask the right questions and you won't know the right questions until you watch other people do it so some other things that you should be doing is you know when you come in early typically you know not come don't come in at nine come in at 8 30 and you know walk into that deal maker that you want to start building a relationship with you know bring them coffee or just you know start chatting them up and asking them questions and you know, take those credit apps that they've done and, you know, ask them about those credit apps or just ask them about their day and their deal flow in general and start, you know, watching and and listening to how they talk about the clients that they're considering lending to and the issues and the challenges. And again, what you're trying to do is pick up the lingo, pick up the, the mentality of what is a good client and what is a bad client. Now, don't be afraid to do the grunt work for these deal makers. When you're talking to them, building relationships, say, hey, listen, if you need me to spread any financials or build a model or, you know, like just do some industry analysis for one of your deals, like I'm totally available. I can do it after after work hours. I can do it on the weekend. Like you let you give me whatever you need and happy to help out. You know, try to be supportive of them. And, you know, those, a lot of people will reward you by saying, you know, hey, okay, come to this client, you've done the industry research, you know, you can come out to the meeting where, where I present the term sheet or whatever. And again, just be the fly on the wall and just watch and listen how they talk to the client and keep doing this. You know, so I think one of the important things is you don't want to go to one or two meetings and then go take your own meetings. You want to go to, you know, three, four weeks of meetings with deal makers and, you know, get at least 10, 15 meetings under your belt, you know, because every client's different and they're going to talk to the client in a different manner based on their personality and based on their needs and the, based on the type of conversation. You know, is it a new client? Or is, is it an existing client? Or is it, you know, a, a special loan situation where the loan is underperforming? So each scenario is different and you need to just keep watching and learning what types of questions they ask for each situation. And all of this requires you to be ready to work outside of normal business hours. So typically people have this understanding that investment banking is the only place where you work long hours. That's not true. You know, I was putting in 15-hour days on commercial banking, but that's because I was taking on a lot of extra work to get that exposure quickly because I wanted to make sure that I was well-equipped and prepared to go out on my own and run my own book of business sooner rather than sit around for two years and eventually get a, get a deal on my on my book. Now, once you've built a good understanding of credit underwriting, you've gone to some meetings, the other key area I find that a lot of people ignore is the risk team. And the risk team typically have a combative attitude. I put this diagram over here to kind of show you. You know, the customer thinks of the bank as one, but there's really two salespeople. There's the relationship manager, which is you, the person watching the video, the people that are bringing in the deals. And then there's a Chinese wall where, you know, the on the other side, it's the risk adjudicator. The risk adjudicator almost never talks to the customer directly. All information flows through the relationship manager who submits the credit app and, you know, engages and almost negotiates with the risk adjudicator. So this relationship between the outside and the inside is pretty combative at times. You know, like a relationship manager is trying to meet their budget, you know, put more deals on the books. The risk manager is trying to protect the book, make sure that the right deals are put on the book. So, you know, they're kind of butting heads at times. But what I found was really successful for me during my time is that I looked at risk as an ally and they can be your greatest ally. So start developing a relationship with them early on and it will reward you greatly. I I, I don't see anyone actually, I haven't, I don't see a lot of people when they're junior and, you know, they're just kind of learning their way around the bank. They don't go and build a relationship with the risk, risk team too quickly. 
you know, they kind of see them as almost a scary, you know, group or, you know, they're the combative area, but that's not true. You know, you're a new employee, you know, go up to that risk team and very similar to a deal maker, you know, before work or after work, bring him some coffee, take him out to the coffee, take him out to lunch, whatever the case is, start communicating with the risk team and asking them the same questions that you would of a, of a deal maker. You know, same thing. What do you what do you what do you believe to be the competitive advantage of the bank? Like, what are you seeing in the book today? And one of the advantages of being a risk adjudicator is that a risk team typically they're centralized. So, you know, divisions or regions for relationship managers will all feed into a provincial or state risk group. And that risk group will manage multiple teams. So that risk adjudicator is not only looking at deals from your team, but from other multiple teams. So they have a really good global view of the types of deals that are getting done in market. So talking to them and and asking them, well, what are you seeing as the most common deals? Why are they being one in your opinion? Or what are relationship managers in other districts? doing, trying to gain some insight from that risk team is critical. I, I, I picked up some great areas. Like I remember talking to my risk manager and saying, what industries are you seeing? It's like, oh, you know, the freight and transport industry was really kicking off when I was there. And I was like, okay, boom, I'm going after the, the truckers of the world. And I picked up a ton of deals like that. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're leveraging the insight from your risk team. And then as well, you can ask your risk adjudicator, what do you want to see in credit apps? Where do relationship managers make mistakes? Why do loans go bad? What should I be looking out for? And probing and picking up these insights will make you a better lender in general and will also, from reputationally, be you will be seen as someone that is balanced and fair. And that's really good for your risk manager because when you submit your first deal, that risk manager will be like, oh, you know what? That's Robert. I know Robert. We talked about bad deals. And you can almost even jokingly say, ah, you know, like, ha ha, you see, I did the, what you told me to do and blah, 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 right? So you want to try to build that relationship with risk because they can be your greatest ally. Now, you know, uh, the best training ground is the loan book. So typically commercial bankers are giving an existing client book or list, and they're going to manage that book of business in addition to bringing in business. The problem is most bankers view their book as a burden. You know, it doesn't count towards your year-end bonus because bankers are, are, you know, really evaluated on new business brought in, not existing business. So the book that you're managing is, you know, a portfolio of loans and, and clients, you know, operating lines, equipment loans, whatever the case is. And it can range from 20 clients to 150 clients, depending on how big of a book you're given. And that, you know, a lot of people see that as a chore. They see it as, well, you know, I'm not getting paid for this. Um, You know, these are existing clients and they're asking me for day-to-day things that I just, it's, it's distracting me from selling and getting more deal flow. And that's a totally fair comment. But for someone that's new, such as yourself, you know, you don't want to, you know, adopt that same mentality. You want to use that book as your practice ground because they're existing clients. So what are they going to do? They're going to move their business because, you know, you made a mistake in a meeting and you asked the wrong question. No, you know, they're just going to, you know, think less of you, but, you know, at least you're not screwing up, you know, key prospect relationships. So, you know, you really want to kind of focus in. And so what typically happens is, you know, you've read the credit apps, don't do this week one, do this kind of, I'd say, you know, week kind of three or four, contact all the clients in your book and ask for an in-person meeting and say, hey, listen, you know, I, I'm new here, I'm transitioning for over from, you know, John Doe, and I'd like to kind of come out and meet you. I'd love to learn about your business, make sure that I'm well informed, just so that I can support you. And so, you you know, they'll, they'll obviously say, yeah, because you're the banker. So yeah, sure. Okay, come on out, like I can accommodate you here. And so ask for a site visit, and ask for a, a discussion, say, hey, listen, I'm going to come out for, you know, two, three hours, I'll sit down with you, kind of learn about your business, we'll do the site tour, and we can just kind of ca- catch up. Either way, you're going to have to do this, because usually the banks require that at least once a year, a banker goes out and does a site visit just to check in with the client. So you can get that out of the way, and also use that whole conversation as great practice ground. 
So, you know, I remember my first site tour. <laughs> I didn't know what to ask. I didn't know the name of any equipment or anything. And I was just kind of like, you know, eyes wide open. I walked in and walked through that facility. But it was amazing. It was so quickly I was able to pick up. I went to the second, the third, the fourth site tour as I was going down the book. And all of a sudden I started, you know, recognize similar pieces of equipment. That's a CNC machine. You know, that's a, a transport trailer truck. That's a dry van truck. You know, and I learned these terms in the lingo, which allowed me to converse with new prospects as well. But there was no pressure because they were existing clients. So I was able to go in, do the site tour, and then I'd sit down and I'd start practicing questions that I learned from the deal makers that I was chatting with. Hey, you know, how's business going? Uh, are you growing? Do you have any capacity challenges? That's a good one. Always ask, you know, what, you know, and you start asking these open-ended questions and all of a sudden, you know, it, they'll start feeding you opportunities. So we'll start feeling you say, you know what? Yeah, you know, we're, we're kind of struggling with um, the existing CNC, like we're running at full capacity on it, we may need to hire some people. And you may say, hey, listen, you know, have you thought about, you know, taking out another equipment loan to finance a new piece of equipment, or something like that, you know, and, and it's not about getting business as much as it is about building your own confidence, and just practicing asking those questions. Because I just remember, I, I like I put myself in your shoes, you know, being new, there was this almost fear of, you know, I was very junior, I was very young in my 20s, and you have like a 50, 60-year-old business owner, and you try to ask them a question, and, you know, you, you want to say it with conviction, and you want to be purposeful and effective in asking those questions. So, again, perfect training ground. And another thing is that, you know, in, in commercial banking in general, to source business, you go through accountants, uh, lawyers, you know, business brokers, et cetera, et cetera. So you're working through a COI network. And so similarly, when I first started, I didn't know a single accountant. You know, I didn't know where to start. I didn't know how to meet people. So I used the book to get my first accountant introduction. So I, when I would go to these site visits, I'd spend the two, three hours. Obviously, if you show interest, business owners are typically going to be a lot kinder to you. And at the end of the meeting, I also said, hey, you know what, you know, John, thank you for touring the business. This is wonderful. Great to hear that you're doing well. Um, you know, as, as I'm continuing to develop my book of business, uh, you know, I'm looking to connect with other accountants. Can I meet your accountant, you know, John Doe or whoever it is? And, you know, some people will say no. Some people will say yes. But again, it's good practice to ask a question. It's good practice to get here a no and, and you'll react to the no. And it's also good practice because eventually someone's going to say, yeah, sure, yeah, I'll go connect you with John. And boom, you got a warm lead. So now you can go and pick up the phone, call that accountant and say, hey, listen, I was just talking to my client, John, and who recommended I reach out to you. Oh, okay. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, you know, I work for JP Morgan or Scotiabank. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm a lower mid market lender. Do you have any other clients that are looking to borrow money? And boom, now you're known to that person and they may not have a deal today, but you keep calling on them, and but you know someone. And that's how you start building a professional network to source business. Use your book, meet them, practice, and ask them for their professional advisor connections. Can you connect me with your accountant, with your lawyer, with your business advisor? And obviously ask one of each, not you know three from one person, but you know ask someone you know to give you that lead. And if you pick up three, four, five you know connections to accountants or lawyers, that's enough. That's enough to start really generating some leads and deal flow to meet other new prospects. So that's a really important way to get there. Now, developing your sales confidence, it comes across the first four steps, right? It's not something that's, you know, formulaic and that comes in now, you know, it, it, you're slowly building and understanding, you know, how to land, how to talk, how to meet and how to ask. Now, finding your sales identity and confidence is an evolving process. And you want to use these first few meetings with your existing book as a practice ground to communicate and act in meetings professionally and, and being someone that's young. So don't be laid back. What you want to do is you always, I always try to think of deliverables. What am I looking to achieve in that meeting? I'm looking to tour the business. I'm looking to ask them how business is going. I'm looking to check in to make sure they don't have any capacity issues or they want to do something big that would need money. And then also at the end, I want to make sure that I ask for a COI introduction. Boom, 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 boom. I did it. You know, so that, you know, meetings are purposeful. I find that sometimes people just let the business owner talk and they just ramble on and blow through two hours and waste time. And it's like, no, 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 you want to kind of keep the business owner on track. So you want to be dictating the, the, the agenda. Now, typically bankers, when in a sales scenario, open up 
conversations and leads and find out about a client's problems through questions. You know, you want to be inquisitive. So you need to learn the common questions. You know, how's business going? Are you looking to buy this capacity? Um, you know, any labor issues? Uh, what are some complaints or some issues? And you want to start asking these open questions. And it's not a yes, no, it's more of a, oh, business is this or no, I'm having this. And you know, it leads to them informing you as the banker about their problems. And if you can react quickly enough, and if the opportunity presents itself, you can then say, hold on a second, that problem, I can solve that with this product, you know, whether it is a loan or whether it is an operating line, whatever the case is. So you want to, again, watch experienced bankers and start to practice that. And I, I put this this little kind of uh, bar here at the bottom to kind of show you. So I, I, I kind of personally view sales as there's there's really two spectrums. Like the, the spectrum is, you know, you're ultra formal and professional. You're very, you know, you're showing up in a suit and tie and, you know, you're showing up, on, you know, like not a minute late. You're on, on the dot and you're very kind of like, oh, you know, I allocated an hour and this is, you know, our full hour. Or whatever the case is, and then there are the you know the chummy, the fun, you know the joking around, and and so that's kind of the spectrum that I would see among commercial bankers: ultra professional or ultra chummy sales broy. You know, I use that term you know lightly, but it's true. And you know, you kind of you want to kind of fit yourself on that scale, not to be on one end or the other, because if you're too chummy and fun, and you have no, you don't have any experience, you're unproven. People are not going to take you seriously. And if you're too professional and formal, you know, people are going to look at you like a stick in the mud, and you're not you can't connect with clients. So you want to be in the middle. You want to be very professional, especially because you're young. People, you're unproven, so you want to be well prepared. You want to be on time all the time, making sure that you're dressing properly. But at the same time, you have you're you're a little bit you know more personable. You're interesting. You know, being interesting makes people want to talk to you. And that's something that I find that a lot of you know juniors they they're so silent or the only thing that they'll ask is only super business related. Sometimes you know having that conversation, talking about non business topics at the start of the meeting, open up the conversation and make the client or prospect feel more comfortable with you. So you want to develop the confidence not to be on one side or the other, but to play both sides of the spectrum and find that balance that works for you. So for me, I kind of lean towards this side now, you know, I'm proven, I don't really need to kind of always be ultra formal, I can be a lot more fun and, you know, kind of be the comic relief in the meeting. But people know what I do, people know what I can, what, what I can do. You know, at the very beginning, I was a lot more on this side of the spectrum. I was very professional. I was worried about being too fun and not being taken seriously. And I slowly built that confidence to, to you know, socialize outside of the business topic of the day. Okay, so now you've gotten the practice, you know, you know your product called, now is the time when you get out into the market and meet prospects. So again, a lot of people try to do step six and step one, I say you back this off and in the first 90 days, no one expects you to bring in business, even in the first six months, to be honest, like it's really tough, especially coming out of school and not having a network at all. So you want to take the early days to really invest in that foundation, as I said, so now that you've invested in the first five steps, you can now go and start sourcing leads. And typically leads come from a few areas in the market. COI, as I said, is the first one, centers of influence. That is going to be the best area for leads. You know, and these are typically business professionals that are targeting your client segment. So for me, I worked at a bank where I was lending one to $50 million in term loans, so lower mid-market. So I would go after lower mid-market accountants and lawyers and insurance agents and real estate and business brokers and wealth managers that supported independent blue-collar business owners and business coaches that would work with that segment. So I would go after those COIs and work, work them first in meeting them, taking them out for coffee, and then doing it on repeat. Remember, one meeting is not enough to open up a COI conversation. You want to build that relationship on an ongoing basis. I've I've built a relationship with COIs that I've had for multiple years, never got a single lead, but it's a long game. It's a very long sales cycle. So you want to be on top of mind. You want to be on the radar. And when a deal comes up, they want to think of you first as a person that's been there consistently and repeatedly always looking to serve that COI and do a good job. 
So that's the first one. Now, the other one a lot of juniors are tasked in doing is calling direct businesses, okay? So you're picking up the phone and you're trying to call, you know, you're going through the industrial district and the business directory and boom, 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 calling everything. So direct calling can be effective. And you, again, you want to have those opening sales questions. You know, hey, are you having any trouble with your business? You're looking to buy a competitor? You're looking to buy a piece of real estate? Uh, do you own your piece of real estate? Uh, do you have any capacity issues? You know, is there a piece of equipment you've been eyeing? How would you invest a million dollars in your business today if you were to giving it, if you were given it? You know, these kind of things, opening sales, opening questions to kind of open up that conversation and win their attention quickly. And you're going after either the owner or what I found to be successful is to target the number two, the CFO especially if there's a CFO in the company, and for most mid-sized companies there is, the CFO is tasked with managing the accounting relationship and managing the finance stuff. The entrepreneur is not going to be very strong in most instances with the finance stuff, so the CFO handles that. So going through the CFO, and a lot of people call the owner only, so the CFO doesn't get a lot of calls. So funny enough, they usually pick up a lot quicker than the owner will, and that's really where you should be focusing. Others would be events, you know, events are, you know, joining the local M&A club, the real estate club, going on Groupon and an Eventbrite and trying to find any type of networking function. And I don't look at these as mostly big, high volume areas of, 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 of leads. Really events and networking events are all about practicing your sales pitch because you're going to be going and meeting a ton of people. Most of them are going to be garbage, to be honest. You're not going to get a ton of leads, but there'll be one or two accountants that you might meet that'll be really good. But what you're practicing in each and every interaction is your elevator pitch. Who am I? What's my product? What do we do really good? And boom, 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 you keep doing that. And, you know, a year or two down the line, you know that cold and you're confident and and the conviction is there. And people want to work with bankers that know they can fix a problem. Not, oh, I have this thing. Do you, are you looking to borrow money? No, 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 no. You're not, it's not a, you never ask, are you looking to borrow money? You're probing for a problem and delivering a solution saying, I can fix that for you. Remember, that's how you kind of get the lead there. And another really good area that I found in the early days was LinkedIn. You know, brush up, get that professional photo done, you know, have a clear description of what you're doing, what your target market is. And same thing, hit the business owners and hit the CFOs and just do the in-mail and just say, hi, my name is Robert. Uh, I work for Scotiabank. I fund lower mid market companies. Uh, We have several manufacturing businesses that we're currently financing. Your company fits that criteria. I would love to connect. Are you or something like that, you know, and then put your number and your email so that they can quickly call you if they see the message come across their phone, or they can, you know, obviously reply over LinkedIn. So again, it's it's another sales volume technique, you're not going to get a ton of leads, but you're going to get those connections over time, and it's going to build up. So these are some of the areas where you can, you know, really get that exposure. And, you know, I'll give you this thing. So I, I, I remember, I set such high expectations for myself when I joined that I told myself I was going to get a first deal in four months. You know, four months passes by. Okay, six months. Six months passes by. No, no, no. This next month, the seventh month, seventh month passes by, and I and I got my first deal in the eighth month of the job. So it's going to take a lot of time. And in most instances, you know, getting deals, sometimes it's going to come from the seniors that will just pass off a lead to you, or it's going to come direct through these things, you know, targeting the COIs and, you know, someone picking up the phone and saying, oh, you know, Robert, you called me a while back. Uh, you know, your client had referred you to me. I have another client in the manufacturing space that's looking to buy a piece of real estate you know are you interested and yeah okay get get that meeting and take that lead and and start practicing that so you know it's going to take time but you want to make sure that you know the bet the worst thing that can happen and i I, and I, i truly believe this is that if you go into the market too early and you meet a coi and you just screw it up you know you say oh well yeah we'll do that it's like, really, you do that? And then, you know, they know that you don't lend that type of product or, you know, you you, you just, you, you fumble in that conversation and you come off as a kid or you come off as inexperienced and not really well prepared. Well, you've really burnt that COI relationship or you've burnt that contact because it's going to be really tough to win back their trust and respect of you versus every single meeting that you take, once you get out in step six, you're well prepared that's going to increase the chances of you getting a deal sooner. 
So don't use new prospects and leads as your training ground. Use your existing book and the internal network of deal makers and risk managers that can expose you to deals to learn and practice so that when you go out into the market, finally, you're ready. And this should be done three months down the line, 90 days. Typically, the first 90 days, don't even think about calling a new lead or a new COI. Work on the first five steps. 90 days now, boom, get into the market and start calling and working. And then be patient. So some final pieces of advice. You know, I'll finish. I'll start off by obviously saying the first thing I told you. Never forget money is the commodity. People have so many options to borrow money nowadays. Money is so cheap. There's just so much money floating around the economy. And, you know, it's going to continue for some time that it's going to be very difficult for you to just simply say, hey, I got money. Do you want to borrow it? No, 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 no. That's not how it works. It's ultra competitive. You need to deliver a solution. And you need to be, you know, find that conviction and that connection with the client because cl- clients are not only working with the money that they're being lent, but the lender that they're connect uh, connecting with. So be interesting, you know, have a personality, and be someone that they want to talk to, not someone that's a bore or a drag or just seems completely inexperienced. Now, as I said, you're not expected to be a rainmaker day one. You know, you got to learn first, have that patience. And make sure that you don't burn out. So don't set, you know, very quick expectations for yourself because it's very going to, it's, it's hard to meet those expectations. You know, really you should start worrying about, you know, deal generation if you've passed year one, but if in that first year in month nine or 10 or 11, you get a deal, that's good. You know, a lot of people don't get that or they, they depend on other deal makers within the district to refer business to them. And they're, they're more reliant on people to do the sourcing for them. And they're, they'll never be successful, unfortunately. There's a lot of people that, that are like that. Now, centers of influence will rarely give you a deal the first meeting. So in that first meeting, when you call on that accountant, they're just getting to know you. They're going to ask you what you lend, how you lend. So again, know your product. But you want to plant the seeds and then follow up. Rainmakers always follow up. Touch base every quarter. Reach out and say, hey, John, just checking in. Uh, We had a conversation in early March. Uh, How are things doing? Hopefully your family's okay. Uh, I just want to check in and see if you had any clients that are, you know, looking to connect. Maybe you're, you know, interested in borrowing some money or whatever the case is. Boom, you connect. And sometimes even you don't even want to phrase it that way. You could just say, hey, John, uh, you know, I know we spoke last time. I'd love to take you out for coffee and get to know you on a much more personal level. You know, are you available? And people love free coffee. So take them out. Boom. Now, always make the first move. You know, you're trying to give before you receive. And what that means is that typically when you're young and, you know, you have a book, a business, what you can give is other introductions. You know, you can't give business because you you yourself are looking for business, but there are other introductions out there. If you met five accountants and you connected with a lawyer, lawyers get a ton of deals from accountants. So you can go to that lawyer and say, you know, hey, listen, like uh, I, I know an accountant at uh, KPMG. Would you like to connect with them? Sure. Okay, perfect. Boom, you make that connection. And now you've put their needs above yours. And the next time they almost feel indebted that they're going to have to make a connection to you in the future. So always try to take that approach where you make the connection first or you try to give something maybe some local market insight you know if you if if your book of business is heavily exposed in one sector then maybe you try to take the knowledge from the existing book and give it to new prospects so here's an example you know you're lending to the dentist industries and you're in the medical professionals practice and you're a commercial banker for medical professionals you can converse with your existing book take their insights and just regurgitate it to new prospects bingo and all of a sudden you you seem connected you seem like you're on top of the industry and the changes and you know boom you're giving insight so that's a really good way to stand out in those first management uh, first prospect meetings now i had i had told you this before find your personality entrepreneurs and business owners respect bankers that challenge them in a constructive and intelligent way. You have to be interesting. Don't be a stick in the mud. Don't be someone that is ultra professional. As I, as I showed you the spectrum, try to be in the middle. Try to, try to find and develop some confidence so that you're not too formal and that you're completely boring. And I know some boring bankers that just, I don't know how they get leads. I mean, just, and, and even their clients don't like calling them, they'll call other people. And then, you know, the, the boring banker is going to ultimately going to have to do the work anyways. So just try to be interesting and develop that personality for yourself. Now, also find some, find some good questions to 
you know, generate the, the answers that you need so that you can start finding the problems for the client and delivering the solutions via your products, your loans. So there are some really good questions out there that I picked up over the years and you know, I'm going to give them to you. My favorite one off the bat is if I were to give you a million dollars today, where would you spend it in the business? You know, and, and, and so a lot of people will look at that big sum of money and they'll try to, they'll, they'll really quickly go to what are their pain points. So it's a very good way to quickly analyze what their pain points are. You know, if they say equipment, then it's a capacity issue. If they say uh, hiring, um, you know, an HR person putting out ads, then they have a labor issue. If they say, oh, you know, I just buy that piece of uh, the property that I'm operating out of, then they probably just, you know, need the, the money for the down payment for to for them to buy the property or it could be oh you know there's not a lot of things i'd spend but i have this competitor i want to buy bingo you know now you know that they need a growth or acquisition so you know it's a really good question to open up kind of the blue ocean of you know what their needs are today and what the pain points are another really good question is how many weeks per year do you take off for vacation and so what this question does is it's going to reveal how critical they are to the business. If they say, I haven't taken a vacation in five years, that means they can't take their eye off the ball. They don't have a management team around them. They're very lean, and most likely there's a key man risk situation. So you've identified a risk, and not only that, but now you need to analyze that risk if you're going to consider lending to them. You know, there's a lot of situations where an owner is so heavily dependent on themselves to generate leads and to generate business that, you know, some bankers and risk adjudicators can look at that and say, well, if they get hit by a bus tomorrow, there's the business is worth nothing. And, you know, our loan, we're going to be, we're going to lose that loan. So, you know, it's a really good question to identify key man risk. And the third question I love, it's so simple. Who is your ideal customer? If what, what, what if you had to describe the perfect customer for your business, you know who would it be, and why do they buy from you? Why would they buy from you? And what that does is it allows them to quickly, you know, summarize, you know, what target of the, uh, segment of the market are they targeting, and why do customers buy from them? And it just helps you just generally understand their business in a much more simpler context. So that these are questions that I'd ask early on, and you kind of take what they give you and work with it. And that's how you eventually get to the problem, and that's how you eventually deliver the solution to get to the point where you can give them a term sheet and, and deliver that solution. So I, you know, this is how what I found to be really successful and what a lot of senior deal makers will do. They'll ask really good probing questions. Now, some other things, uh, you know, one of my senior bankers when I was learning, you know, told me this, you know, you're paid to network. At the end of the day, if you're a relationship manager front facing in the, in the front office, you know, use that corporate card and get out in front of people. People love free things. They love to go for free coffee and get $7 coffees for Starbucks and they love lunches, you know, take them out to lunch and, and just burn through that corporate credit card. And in most instances, you're never going to hit the budget. You know, they give you like a thousand dollar a month kind of budget, like, you know, use the full thousand dollars and get out into the market and meet as many people as you can. Now, Salesforce is, you know, really a CRM system that will track meetings and you'll, and a lot of bankers roll their eyes when, you know, the, the VPs of, of commercial banking will say, update your Salesforce, everyone, because it's a, it's seen as a chore, you know, like going for a meeting and then taking down notes and retyping those notes into Salesforce can be seen as a chore that's non-revenue generating. It's not going to bring in business for you to get a higher bonus, but what it does is it helps you stay on top of your lead pipeline. And so what I would recommend is that you actually use Salesforce. You know, get in there. It doesn't have to be sales. It could be a CRM system in general, but Salesforce is what typically the banks use. Now use that system because you want to make sure that you're taking notes. You know, you bring a pen and paper in your meetings and you take notes because maybe it's not a, a problem today, but it may be a problem in the future. So I'll give you a good example. So I was lending to a trucking company. I had a meeting with them a year and a half before, and they were saying, you know, listen, we just bought these new pieces of equipment. It's going really well. We don't really need anything right now. We are really going to be worried if, um, you know, this uh, the, the NAFTA agreement, you know, comes into question because all of a sudden we're going to really need to pivot our business towards another sector and serve another client segment. So, you know, obviously a year and a half later, I was looking through my sales force, things were happening and, and the threat of NAFTA and really kind of the changes to NAFTA were going to come through because of the Trump administration. So, I, you know, I looked up that client, I said, bingo, I'm going to call them and I'm going to 
pull back exactly what we started talking about in the last meeting. Hey, you know, John Doe, uh, you know, good to touch base. I remember we were talking about, you know, the NAFTA thing, like how are you pivoting the business? And all of a sudden, boom, you've picked up the conversation where you last left off. You seem well-prepared, very professional and interested. And that client all of a sudden, oh yeah, yeah, we're talking about it. Well, thanks for asking. Yeah, we're going to need this. And bingo, now you have the problem that you can lend into. So taking notes, staying on top of past prospect meetings, is really good because it's not always going to be the first meeting when you meet a business owner. Sometimes they'll get referred in and the need, the need is immediate. Sometimes it's not. So having a good records keeping notebook process is important. Now, don't sit around in, in the office and wait for leads to come in. You know, all the deal makers, especially during the summer and, you know, in the spring and fall season, hit the market, get out, take everyone for coffee, take anyone for coffee, and just take as many meetings as you can. If you're sitting around waiting for leads to come from your existing network of COIs, you're not doing it right. The right way to do it is you're always investing your free time into building more expanding your network even more, meeting more COIs, meeting more people, meeting going to more events. So always make sure that you're not sitting around, especially if you don't have any deals in the pipeline right now, pick up that phone, work it hard. Also leverage your internal resources. So I had talked about this, right? Referrals lead to more referrals. So maybe you picked up a prospect that is interested in wealth management products. Well, make sure that you know someone in the wealth management division. Make sure you know someone in the bank branch network so that when that lead comes in or you ask that probing question, and it may not be your product, but some someone else's product within the bank, take that lead, refer it to them, take that you know, wealth manager out for coffee afterwards and just say, hey, listen, you know, this is really good. I'm just trying to feed someone and start building a relationship internally. And boom, you're on their radar. They're on your radar. And, and the leads will start exchanging between the two parties. And eventually you're going to get a lead back from them that may lead to a loan. So, you know, build that internal network, invest the time in meeting at least one person from each division, from cash management, investment banking, wealth management, and build those networks. Now, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, these, this is more just a little relevant for etiquette purposes. But, you know, business lunches are going to be something that you're going to commonly go out. You know, whether you're taking out an accountant or a client up for a deal closing, you know, you're going to be on the road a lot eating lunch and going out and all to all these restaurants. And you're not going to pay for it, right? Because you're going to have a corporate card. So what I would recommend is just have the etiquette done, down pack, learn how to eat, Learn, learn, learn the actions of how to behave professionally and in a proper manner. Because those things, if you know, if you're not eating correctly, it, it just shows a lack of professionalism and inexperience. You're a child. You're still, you know, eating like you're, the way your mom fed you. It just it it communicates the wrong message. So etiquette's really important. And as well, from a health perspective, you know, try try to keep the 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 meals cleaner, right? You know. Even though you're not paying for things, you shouldn't be getting steak and frites every lunch because that's going to add up and that's going to come back to bite you. So what I typically recommend is it has to be greener fish, you know, whether it's a Buddha bowl or, you know, a salad or, you know, it's more of a fish plate, you know, eat those types of meals because you're not going to be tired post lunch and you want to take a nap. You can go back to the office and continue to work. It's not heavy. So it's obviously, you know, the calories are less and, you know, it's a lot healthier and you're as well, from the client's perspective, you know, if you order a lobster tartare and they order a salad, you know, they're thinking, well, are you just, you know, using the bank's money to get good food or are you here to talk to me, right? And it just, again, it just, uh, from a perception perspective, try to eat clean and avoid big dishes and always wait for the client to, to decide whether you want to order a beer or not. If you're young and, you know, obviously, you know, beer drinkers or you're t having a glass of wine or whatever the case is, you know, don't go, you know, don't, let the cl client order first or the COI order first. If they don't order a beer, don't order a beer because you don't want to be the person that, you know, is drinking a beer and they're having water. And again, you're, you're kind of skewing yourself, throwing yourself off. You know, you're obviously not getting intoxicated, but you're trying to remain 100% focused on the purpose of that meeting, which is to generate a lead not to have good food, heavy food, or drink a lot during the meeting. So just some basic etiquette around lunches. And then the last one, and I put this last because it is true, at the end of the day, not everyone is destined for sales. 
So you need to you know, go through this 90-day process and kind of give it a year or two. But after two years, if you're not generating leads, then it may be better for you to consider an alternative because not everyone is going to have that confidence and is going to you know have the will to keep put pushing and pushing for leads and to, to make sure that the pipeline's big enough to get those inbound kind of leads converted over into actual closed deals. So recognize that if two years down the line, it's not working, you can take the experience that you've had and either go into risk or go into other areas, uh, you know, other verticals within the finance sector. And, and that can be a separate video, but I just wanted to leave you guys off with that one. So that's really it, guys. Uh, hopefully you found the video helpful. If you have any questions or comments or stories, you know, I, I love to kind of support in any way I can. So please comment below the video. And if you found the video helpful, then please like, like, like the video and subscribe to the channel for more content related to commercial banking. And if you want to connect outside of the YouTube ecosystem, hit me up over LinkedIn, or you can go on my website at uh, Rob Lee Capital, which is my M&A investment bank. And I can kind of connect with you and help you uh, obviously better yourself in the commercial banking world. So hopefully you guys found the video helpful and have a great day. Thank you.